Hi, my name is Gary Glick and I'm the president of Friends of RGV Reef. What that means is that I'm barely smart enough to run a nonprofit and stupid enough to volunteer. <laughs> Friends of RGV Reef started as my brother and I, and it's still, in this illustrious company, we're such little chickens. It's four guys, and we've all still got day jobs. We all grew up near the water, and it, it instilled in us this desire to see things better. But it took us many years to get to the point where we could do something about it. So RGV Reef is located in the four million submerged acres of the state of Texas. The state of Texas extends out three leagues from shore, which is nine miles. And it's unique in many ways. It's the largest artificial reef in the state of Texas. It's the third largest artificial reef in the Gulf of Mexico. It uh, has even, even in the three years that we've been putting material in it, it has the most material in it of any reef in the state of Texas. And part of the reason that we're able to do that is because we do use the materials of opportunity. It's what we can scrounge. The, um, it's the only reef off the Texas coast that's not being built as a monoculture of reefing pyramids. We are building the, all the graduated stepping stones of habitat to try to carry red snapper through all their life stages. And I'm going to talk a lot about red snapper because that's where the recreational and commercial importance is. That's where the research is. If I say red snapper will only move uh, five miles in 24 months, that's Galloway and Sedgelmeyer. It's not a wild story inspired by too much rum on the dock, although we have a little of that. Um, so Friends of RGV Reef is, is four old salts, and we all got great joy from the Gulf when we were young and grew up, got real jobs, and got in a position to start to really seriously fish again and decided to give back. From what, from what we saw, the, um, if you wanna know what's going on with a fish stock, one of the things you can do is you can ask an old fisherman. And you can also ask a 27 year old marine biologist, and this is not to denigrate a 27 year old marine biologist. As reef builders, I think we're the only people in the Gulf of Mexico that pay attention to marine biologists. But that guy wasn't there, he didn't feel it. He, he didn't damn near get jerked out of the boat as a kid. When we were young, there were a lot of fish. My father and my uncle took my brother and I offshore in a 16-foot boat in the 60s, and we didn't know anything, and we blundered around, blundered around and caught fish and had a fabulous time. But we've been watching the fish stocks go in the toilet for about 30 years and decided that we would try to do something about it. And reefs are fabulous. You know, it's good. There's a lot of fish there. Let's just build an artificial reef. So we started trying to figure out what we were going to do to build an artificial reef. Everything we wanted to do was going to be a felony if we weren't going to get a permit. <laughs> and being down there in South Texas with all the ojos they've got to watch for drug smugglers, we found out later on they got a camera sitting on top of the Coast Guard station that can do facial recognition at 17 miles. They were going to catch us. So we got this wild idea that we might be able to pester Texas Parks and Wildlife and get a permit. And so uh, the guy that runs uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Artificial Reefing, Dale Shively, actually took us a little under his wing and he says, okay, I'm the guy that makes the decision, but here's what you're going to have to do. And we needed to chum up stakeholders. And so 
I live in Austin, my brother lives about 70 miles from the coast. We turned to our old friend and beginnings were so important for RGV Reef in, in what it grew into, but we turned to our old friend, Daniel Bryant, who had industrial dock knowledge. I mean, we knew how to wander around on a recreational dock, but we didn't know how to work an industrial dock. And also Daniel being there close to that area had the connections to make the partnerships, both traditional partnerships and the non-traditional partnerships that made Friends of RGV Reef go. The, um, so we, with Daniel's help, we chummed up the cities and their economic development councils and the chambers of commerce and the fishing tournaments and the charter boat captains associations. We even got the Texas Shrimpers Association to think it was a good idea to foul their bottom with some of our stuff because they're fishermen too and they understood that the fish needed help. So I thought that was really fabulous. We were also supposed to get um, talk to the local marine biologist and we called him and he didn't answer his phone and we called him and he didn't answer his phone and we called him and he didn't answer his phone and hey, we gotta get this marine biologist. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't answer his phone. Well, it doesn't matter. I mean, what can he have seen that that we haven't seen, and between us, we'd spent thousands of hours both under and under the Gulf of Mexico. Um, what we finally got was Dr. Rick Klein. He had seen stuff, stuff, same stuff that we'd seen. This is a part of a oil field, a, an offshore oil rig, jacket leg, that's in a, an artificial reef up the coast a little bit. There's uh, a gray snapper, a couple of adult red snapper, a Bermuda chub. The question is, what's missing from this picture? Okay, so Dr. Klein had seen the same stuff we'd seen. He saw what we didn't see. There's no babies there. Okay, so where are the babies? Well, the babies have been pushed out on the flat. Most of the Gulf of Mexico, all except for 1.6% of the bottom, is flat mud plain with very little food on it, unceasing current, and big fish that are gonna eat you. There used to be a lot of small material on the bottom, um, loosely cemented clay balls, uh, caliche balls, um, organically cemented uh, uh, sandstones. All of this stuff was on the continental shelf and was submerged over the last 40,000 years as as sea levels rose at, with the end of the Pleistocene. Um, it's all been rolled into nothing by shrimp trawls. Uh, the, the Texas shrimp, and I've been a shrimper, and I, I, I don't like to beat up on the shrimpers, but I need to tell the tale. This stuff's been all been rolled up in a ball by bottom trawling. You know, there's the Texas shrimp uh, industry trawled and drug a chain across a million acres of Texas bottom a month for 40 years. And it's, it's, it's just been in nothing. We still find some of it in uh, next to large high relief reef where the shrimp nets can't get. Uh, we also occasionally find it in, in the shrimp trash. It's little black uh, rocks that are all smoothed out. There's, there's nothing there anymore. Um, So, Texas Parks and Wildlife started um, getting the permit and we started gathering up material and we, of course, started stall small. This is um, 2016, that's the very first pieces of concrete that um, we got at uh, RGV Reef. The, over the period of about a year, we gathered up uh, this material uh, it's about 3,700 tons of material, and these are materials of opportunity. Texas Parks and Wildlife said that the population of RGV Reef, which is 1,650 acres, it's a huge reef, was going to take 20 or 30 million dollars in decades. We didn't have 20 or 30 million dollars or decades, so we started getting materials of opportunity. Most, most Texas reefs are built with prefabricated reefing pyramids, and you know, they're 10 feet tall at the base, about eight feet tall. They make one rung on the habitat ladder and that's okay for adult sized fish, but those fish have to be attracted and grown from elsewhere. And elsewhere it's real short of fish now too. Um,
We also bought a bunch of off-spec, that's uh, 67,000 uh, cinder blocks. We bought off-spec cinder blocks and gathered up the funds and got um, this mm, 1956 model 110-foot uh, landing craft to deploy the material. Um, that first year, don't, not counting the little yellow fish, which went in in 18, um, we, we deployed the material. This is uh, Thomas Hilton's map. Uh, the little green dots are uh, the nursery reef that we put down. The other um, dots are um, where we got large stuff and medium stuff and small stuff to generate. Uh, lots of different cracks and crevice sizes and lots of complexity. Everybody understands on the land that most of our animals are habitat limited. That's just barely coming to be understood offshore. Um, you, you've got to have complex habitat with lots of different sizes of material to carry these fish through their life stages and complexity generates more species richness and uh, um, biomass. Um, those are juvenile red snapper. Uh, they're about six inches long on uh, cinder blocks in uh, RGV reef. Actually, that's one of Dr. Klein's test patches. But this is what got us excited about cinder blocks. Um, if we put down 67,000 cinder blocks, how many baby snapper did we pull off that flat? When you pull a baby off the flat, You've done tremendous things for their, mor their, their mortality. You reduce their mortality rate. Um, out on the flat, if you give a juvenile fish a rock, then they got a place they can dodge around to get away from a faster straight line predator. If that rock has a sharp edge on it, it'll generate a little vortice which will bamboozle their prey. So you've given them a place to get out of the current, turn their food into body mass, ambush their prey, get away from predators, and you've also generated the bottom of the food chain. So we're also trying to restore the bottom of the food chain by restoring this low relief reef because when you get a slightly denser bunch of organic material on the bottom, then all of a sudden you get worms, you get mollusks, you get crustaceans, and fish sure enough do like worms. So. We've been a little short of research because the research money's been tight, but we luckily, about two months after we put that bunch of material that I've just showed you on the ground, we had the One Golf Consortium went down and um, they made counts of how many juveniles they thought had settled on the reef, and it's 240,000 juvenile snapper. And we don't know exactly what how much we reduce their mortality, but we know it's significant because those fish stayed with us. We could see them on our, the fathometers. The guys that were diving could see them. And this is a little um, slide that Matthew Strike put together. He works at the Heart Institute, a smart young biologist. I like him a lot. This, this shows the pulse of juveniles. If you look, you can see how the pulse of juveniles settles on the reef and then gets larger as time goes by. Now, this reef is a monoculture, and so by the fall of 14, all those babies had either been caught or eaten because there wasn't, or had to move on because there wasn't enough food because all they had there was a monoculture. Now here on the right is fish that came off of um, RGV reef and there's more fish in the box that you can't see, uh, but it pretty much perfectly reflects the biology. We got 20% of the fish that have attracted from elsewhere, that's that great big sow snapper. And then the remaining fish are fish that we grew on the reef. In 18, um, we had another non-traditional partner, Enbridge, uh, funded us. We had our normal little funding uh, sources, but Enbridge gave us a really nice big chunk of money and made us think we could do big things. And 
Texas Parks and Wildlife Artificial Reefing had been hiding BNSF from me because they were afraid I would steal BNSF from them, which I had every intention of doing. <laughs> and finally, they figured out that ties were such a giant pain in the behind that they weren't going to be able to do it. And they gave us BNSF and we started gathering up railroad ties. For a sense of scale, that's Curtis Hayungs, who is the fourth person in Friends of RGV Reef. He does all of our computer stuff and helps me, and he's a fabulous guy. Um, but there's a sense of scale. That's Curtis there in the, in the middle. Um, Lane? Thank you. So this is uh, EMR International Shipbreaking had that first machine. We've bought the second machine that you're seeing loading and unloading ties. Ties can be a real pain in the behind. They're awkward if you drop one on your toe, you've had it. But they tangle up and they make fabulous habitat because it's exceptionally uh, complex and has all kinds of different cracks and crevices on it. So this is the 32 foot tall big pile. And um, it's 120 feet at the base. It's got 3,700 tons in it. Uh, it actually wedges current rich, I mean, the current wedges nutrient rich water up off the bottom and gets it up into the photic zone where it can benefit plankton. That's one year's incrustation there. And with the surrounding low relief reef and mid relief reef, you've generated this complete food web that, of course, ultimately feeds. Um, apex predators, which we all like to catch and eat. The economic impact. Um, those are some nice numbers. They came from uh, a study that the uh, uh, city of South Padre Island's uh, Economic Development Corporation did. Um, we can also look at the 50 or 60 million bucks that Alabama generates from their very strange but very successful reef. Um, that's how you sell it. That's not what drives us, but that's how you sell it. This shot was just taken uh, about 30 days ago. We've got um, 11,000 tons of uh, Concrete railroad ties stacked up on the on that site. You can't see the 26,000 cinder blocks and and some more broken concrete that we're going to build a 400 acre nursery reef and then armor it against shrimp trawls with almost all of those uh, ties on the north boundary. Uh, that's the ship that we're hoping to get to come. The old uh, Little Mo, the Coasties decided that, that, that guys that have been doing it for 40 years in a boat that was 60 years old couldn't possibly be safe. So they ran off one of the very, very few competent reef builders in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we're having to chum up and train a new one. But anyhow, this fabulous boat, it'll move 500 tons at a pop. So what do we need? Boat money. You know, we've been getting... Um, just about everything donated that we need. That's the one piece that we can't get donated. The, we're super efficient. Um, we put down about 13 times the material of a normal reefing contract. Some of the stuff that we've been getting donated when we were small, now that we're industrial scale, for example, I can't ask EMR to send a $750,000 machine and keep it at my site for six, six more months, and although they've been doing it for off and on for about a year now. Um, we need money to help rail car loading and unloading. We need scientific research because we'd like for this concept to spread up the coast. There's lots of monoculture reef that could become much more productive if it was made to be more complex with materials of opportunity. Um, we need a grant writer. We need an administrative assistant. Um, and I think I'm just going to hire those people because I'm just not going to be able to follow up on, I mean, Texan, this Texan by nature opportunity is a huge opportunity for us. But if we don't have the time because we still have to go to our day jobs to follow up on all the contacts we've made, well, then that's a horrible waste. So those are the things that 
we're heading towards in our next deployment for this summer.